Hello everyone, I'm Kenshin. Welcome to, Talking History. Please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Also, don't forget to turn on the notification bell. Thank you. Today's historical discussion is about the first American judge to be sentenced to prison. While many people pay attention to the judicial news involving former President Trump and the exorbitant fines, there's a piece of news that has been overlooked, yet its importance is undeniable. On August 16, 2022, Federal District Judge Christopher Connor ordered two former Pennsylvania judges to compensate 282 plaintiffs with $160 million in compensatory damages and $100 million in punitive damages. This incident is one of the most serious judicial scandals in American history. Dubbed the Kids for Cash scandal, judges Mark Ciavarella and Michael Conahan accepted $2.8 million in bribes from two for-profit prison owners and developers. They ordered the closure of the county-operated juvenile detention center and, in exchange for kickbacks, sent over 2,300 delinquent youths to the two bribing for-profit facilities, PA Childcare and Western PA Childcare. However, 72-year-old Ciavarella served 28 years in prison in Kentucky and is expected to be released in 2035. 70-year-old Conahan was sentenced to over 17 years, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, he was placed under house arrest. Nevertheless, this is not the first instance of a U.S. judge being sentenced to prison. Next, let's talk about the 1991 marijuana bribery case. In April 1990, a man named Gary Young was indicted for participating in the transportation of marijuana from Belize to Louisiana between May 1985 and January 1986. The marijuana, totaling over 2,500 pounds, was airdropped into Whiskey Bay in the southwest of New Orleans and later recovered by boats. However, Young was already a repeat offender. In the early 1980s, at the age of 36, Young had been incarcerated for over a year due to a cocaine trafficking case in 1981. At that time, he was the general manager of restaurants and bars. After his release from prison, he became involved in leasing a location from the Orleans Levy Board and rebuilding it in the lakefront area of New Orleans. It's worth noting that the previous owner of the restaurant and bar, John Yemelos, was his business partner. The key is that one of Yemelo's acquaintances was John H. Ross, who served on various political appointee boards for over 10 years. Ross was also a close friend of Robert Collins, a judge in the Eastern District Court of Louisiana, often boasting about his ability to influence judges. Whether he had this ability or not remains to be seen. Then, everyone could foresee what would happen next. Yang who faced 15 years of imprisonment for marijuana charges and a five-year interstate travel ban, believed that Collins would decide his marijuana case. After meeting with Ross, Yang proposed the idea of bribing Collins for leniency. Over the following weeks, Yang neither confirmed nor remained idle. On September 27 of the same year, Yang cooperated with federal prosecutors, signing a plea agreement and agreeing to assist in tracking other drug cases as an informant. However, after meeting with Yemelos, Yang discussed once again the possibility of bribing Collins through Ross. On January 22, 1990, Ross and Yang met to discuss the prospect of getting help from Collins. In a phone conversation on February 1, Ross informed Yang that he had met with Collins on January 29 and they had a pleasant conversation. Ross stated, I didn't discuss any names or anything like that, I just told him, ah, dot you know, there's a situation. We'll eat lunch before it comes up and all that business. On March 16th, the government activated pen registers and trap and trace devices on phones located in Ross's office at the Regional Planning Commission, RPC, his private real estate office, and his home, authorized by Judge Duhay. On April 5th, Based on the plea agreement of September 27, Yang was charged with three drug-related counts in the Eastern District of Louisiana. The case was randomly assigned to Judge Patrick Carr. On April 25, Yang met with Ross and showed him the indictment. Yang informed Ross that DeSalvo was preparing to move the case to Collins. Ross reaffirmed that handing the case to Collins was crucial to the deal, saying, that's everything I wanted to happen. 
That's what I wanted to know. That's what I wanted. Ross further confirmed that he had mentioned that situation to Collins, who had instructed Ross to let him know when the matter arose. Ross stated, once the motion for transfer is filed, I'll go see Collins and tell him. Request the case. I mean, don't refuse to take the case. Ross told Yang, once you hear Collins got the case, you'll get down on your knees and thank God. True to form, Yang, who was indicted in April 1990, saw the case indeed transferred to Collins. Following his guilty plea before a judge in May, the prosecutor advocated for an eight-year sentence, but Collins sentenced him to 3.5 years on August 8. However, what Collins didn't anticipate was that Yang, in collusion with Yemelos, was already under FBI surveillance. The evidence included $100,000 marked bills given to Yang by the FBI, to be handed over to Ross, completed between September 29, 1989, and August 10, 1990, over 10 months during which Yang conversed with Ross, unaware of being recorded. Providing irrefutable evidence of cash retrieval from Ross and Collins' properties, they were ultimately charged with bribery, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy. On the afternoon of August 10, the FBI executed search warrants at Ross's RPC office, real estate office, and the security center booth, as well as at Collins's person, his car, and his private office in his room. These warrants were issued by Judges Douay and Chief Judge Clark. Originally, the FBI intended to execute an arrest warrant in Collins's room. When he unexpectedly left, agents followed and stopped him at the first red light about two blocks from the courthouse. One agent approached the driver's side, identified himself as an FBI agent, and instructed Collins to exit the car. Another agent informed Collins of the search warrants for him and his vehicle. Collins asked, what's this about? To which they replied he would find out in a few minutes. The agents then pulled the car over. On the way to the courthouse, Collins inquired about the search, and the agents mentioned allegations of receiving money for sentencing Yang. When Ross was mentioned, Collins described him as an old friend and called him to inform Yang's situation, stating that such calls to sentencing judges were not uncommon. Collins further claimed not to have received any payments from Ross regarding Yang or any other reason and had no business dealings with Ross. In the court testimony, approximately $70,000 was recovered from Ross's real estate office, with about $12,000 remaining unaccounted for. Collins admitted receiving over $17,500, of which $16,500 was found in a locked bookcase in his room, without explaining how he obtained this money. Both were convicted on June 29, 1991. Collins was sentenced to 82 months in federal prison in Panama City, Florida, in September, while Ross served 88 months in a New Mexico prison. Yang, following a separate retrial, had his sentence reduced to three years in prison, while John Yemelos was never charged. Ross died on August 1, 1995, at the age of 63, after serving 43 months. Surprisingly, despite his conviction, Collins did not resign from his judicial position. Consequently, on May 19, 1993, U.S. Representative James Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin introduced impeachment proceedings, which were later referred to the House Judiciary Committee but did not pass. Jack Brooks attempted again in June, resulting in Collins's resignation on August 6, 1993, as the impeachment hearings were scheduled for the following day. This action led to his disbarment in Louisiana by the state's Supreme Court. Returning to the present day, Chavalera at the time sent children as young as eight to detention centers for minor offenses such as petty theft, jaywalking, truancy, and smoking on school premises. Despite being first-time offenders, he vigorously enforced a zero-tolerance policy, subjecting them to handcuffs and shackles and sending them to prison, often without allowing them time to say goodbye to their families. Judge Kona delivered the verdict after hearing testimonies from 282 individuals and 32 parents who attended the Luzerne County Juvenile Court from 2003 to 2008. They described Chavalera in court as cruel, arbitrary, disregarding due process, and displaying arrogance and vulgarity, stated one victim, 
who testified that Chavalera ruined his life and future. Another victim expressed feeling like they were inexplicably sold off, waiting in line with others. On the 16th, Judge Kona explained the verdict, stating that Chavalera and Conahan violated oaths and public trust, causing harm to young vulnerable groups, with many experiencing emotional and mental health issues. He further stated that in this case originating in 2009, many child victims died from drug overdose or suicide during their childhood. The ruling awarded each plaintiff a basic compensation of 1,000 yuan for each day of wrongful imprisonment, with the amount adjustable based on the case circumstances. Considering the significant emotional and psychological trauma inflicted on the victims by two judges, the exorbitant compensation was only awarded to the plaintiffs in this case. From these, we can understand that even judges who swear to be fair can still be tempted by money to act against their duties or satisfy bribery, regardless of nationality. The prime example is the 2010 collective bribery case involving judges of the Taiwan High Court, where corrupt behavior tarnished the image of justice represented, leading to widespread doubts about judicial rulings.